friends, and welcome to The Point. Whether you're on site or online, you're part of a community that values coming together to celebrate in worship. We have a great day planned as we enter into week one of a brand new series. Have you ever felt that lingering feeling that enough is, well, never enough? No matter how much you work, no matter how much you struggle to get ahead, to make life better, you just never seem to make any ground. To make matters worse, when you look around, it seems as if everyone else is doing just fine at the get more game. All of this inner turmoil leads to a lack of happiness. When we are discontent, we are unhappy with our life, our purpose, and with others. You name it, discontentment touches it. Imagine what it might be like to not worry about tomorrow, to not be consumed with consumption. This series will help us realize the freedom that lies at the heart of a life of fulfillment and contentment. If you're joining us today for the first time, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We are so glad you've taken the step to join us either in person or online. We understand that checking out a new place can be a little intimidating, but we want you to know that you are welcome here. We'd love to know that you're with us, so would you please take a moment to now text the word HELLO to 812-359-1799 so we can say hi. When you do that, we'll make a donation to a food bank here in Seymour. Thanks in advance for the opportunity to meet you. For those of you who've been around here for a while and are ready to connect with others beyond the Sunday morning experience, then I'm excited to share with you that our Fall Rooted Small Group session begins on Sunday, September 10th. You may have heard us refer to Rooted and wondered, what's that all about? Rooted is the curriculum we use to launch small groups at the point, and it is truly a catalyst for life change. This 11-week small group experience will help you connect with God, the church, and your purpose. Interested in taking the next step in your spiritual journey? Simply go to our website and sign up for a Rooted Small Group by clicking the Ministries tab or the Connect tab on our church app, and we'll help you get connected. Rooted is also the next step for those who are interested in membership at The Point. For those of you who have been around for a while and call The Point home, we want to thank you for your faithful financial partnership in this ministry. If you are our guest today, we want nothing from you and only want you to receive what God has for you. For those of you who are ready to join the faithful givers who make ministry happen around here week in and week out, then here are the ways to give. You can give on our website at gotothepoint.com or text the point give on your mobile device to 888-364-4483. You can also mail a check to 311 Meyer Street here in Seymour. If you're on site today, there are black boxes on the back wall that you can place your gift inside as you exit this morning. As a part of our worship today, we will be participating in communion later in the service. I just wanna give you a heads up now so those participating online can grab some crackers and juice for our communion time. If you're here on site, you should have picked up the elements as you entered the worship center. If you forgot to grab those, feel free to do that now as we get started this morning. Our giving, our serving, our worship, our very lives are lived in response to what God has already done for us. It's mind blowing to try and comprehend the lengths to which God of the universe has gone to know each one of us and be in relationship with us. God sees us and He loves us, friends. We matter to Him. Let's stand to our feet and thank Him together.
Man, I got a workout doing that, Joel. <laughs> Wasn't that wonderful? Uh, I tell you, this morning, we, I came in and man was preparing and just felt like the Lord was just stirring my heart already. And we had just an incredible time of, of prayer and worship as a team together. And I don't know if you know that, but way before you come here to worship, there is a whole army of people here that is praying for you, praying for our time, preparing so that now we might have time together as a community of faith in a sacred moment. Amen. And that what occurs here is we don't want it to be out of kind of obligation. We never want um, our our worship and our time in God's word to be something that's obligatory or just something that feels kind of out of touch with the reality that God is present, church. I hope you know that. And if you don't know that this morning, maybe you're just drawn here today, searching, maybe you've been wandering, looking for something different, looking for something real and true. I want to tell you that Jesus is alive. And he is the one today that I believe will come out of the words that we read and will spark transformation in our lives more than anything that you will learn or anything that you get in your head. Jesus will come and change you. And I'm excited for that potential today, aren't you, church? And I'm glad to be here with you. I was thinking this past week of all the things that I love. I had a little uh, staycation after we went and saw my family, and we had a smokecation, I call it, and I love smoked meat. But here are some other things that I love. Here's my dad in the giant um, goggles there. Uh, you, you cross the age threshold at some point, and you start buying glasses that are too big for your face. I'm not sure what was. I said, Dad, you look like a giant dragonfly. But anyway, it helped him catch this fish. We went musky fishing. So there's a a few things I love in here. I love to fish. I love muskies. I love my dad. I got to see him this past uh, weekend in Denver. It was so good to be with him. So there's some, some things I love. Um, here's another thing I love. Maybe you recognize this guy. <laughs> Anybody know that guy? Yeah. Yeah. He, he who shall not be named, right? That's <laughs> Pastor Steve. It's okay to say his name. I will not be offended. I love him. He is a dear friend of mine. I love Pastor Steve. Continue praying for his journey, him and Lori, as they seek God's will for their life. Uh, but we are just so grateful for their friendship. So I I love Pastor Steve. If you're watching this morning, I know you are Pastor Steve. I love you, my friend. Here's another thing that I love. Oh, gosh. Easter Sunday. Check it out. Uh, over, I think, 25 people made the decision in their life to be baptized, to proclaim their faith in Jesus. And I love, as a pastor, that I get to be present in moments like that with you. Watching God move and work in your life. Uh, I'm just so grateful. I love watching God move and do awesome things. Here's another thing I love. A couple things in this picture that I love. I love my beard right there. That was fantastic. I love chicken wings. Anybody else? Okay, like eight of you. What is wrong with you people? You like pork and things here. This is chicken wings. I love chicken wings, as you can tell by my face. And this guy right here, he's probably watching online too. This is Tim Hildebrand, a dear friend, mentor of mine. I love Tim Hildebrand. He is wonderful. So now you know one of my best friends. Here's something else that I love. Oh, man. Isn't she beautiful? Like, I just think she's something, man. So this is Heather, my wife, if you don't know her. Uh, And I love her so dearly. She's amazing. Uh, Here is another picture of something I love. Oh! Man, I love my girls. They're so beautiful, too, and this dog we have, (laughs) Bentley. I love him. Uh, And I've been thinking a lot about the things that I love uh, this past week in my life. I wonder, what do you love? Well, uh, just, oh, here we're going to do, I'm going to say one, two, three, and I want you just to all together yell out one thing that you love, just all together, a big mishmash, okay? You got it in your head? Ready? One, two, three. Man, that's great. I love that stuff, too. And we're going to talk today and the next few weeks about what do we love? Because I think what we love is connected to contentment in life. You saw that little uh, teaser coming up here this morning about our next few weeks conversation, the series we're going to talk about, discontentment. And how do we take the dis out of discontentment? I like the R-B, R&B thing going on there. Like, I wanna, how do I take the dis out of discontentment? And let me tell you, if you're anything like me or if you're human, you've dealt with the reality of discontentment in your life. This fleeting feeling like I can never have enough or I can never have what I need, I can never arrive in life where I just am content. And right next to contentment, I feel like, is the emotion of happiness or or joy in life. Because when I'm discontent, I don't know about you, but it affects every part of my life. 
When I'm discontent, discontent, it affects my work, it affects my relationships at home, it affects my outlook between my relationship between God and I. Discontentment will impact everything in your life. And I believe the starting point for our conversation over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about all kinds of nuances of what it means to find a life of contentment, how to take the dis out of discontentment and find happiness. But I believe we got to start at this place with the question, what do I love? Because I think asking the question what we love starts to kind of identify what lives at the center of our lives. Here's a fancy Greek word. I like fancy Greek words. Maybe you do too. It's a Greek word called telos. Telos means the ultimate aim or purpose of life. I believe when I answer the question what I love, it starts to zero in on what lives at the center of my life or what is my telos. Because what's at the center of my life, what I love, usually determines how I live my life. It determines how I spend my money. It determines how I think. Oftentimes, what the center of, what's at the center of my life determines my motivations and perceptions about my relationship with God even. If, and maybe you wonder, we, I love a lot of things. I love chicken wings, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love you know, all those kind of things. But how do you really kind of zero in? Because a lot of the times the things, and I wonder if this is true for you because this happens in my life, the things that I perceive that I love or that are my telos aren't necessarily the things that are actually my telos. Does that make sense? It sounds good for me this morning to tell you, I love my family, they're my telos, they're my purpose. Right? Or, or maybe the, the church answer, I, God is my telos. He's the center of my life, and I've devoted everything to him. Well, I can give lip service to a lot of things that are the center of my life, but actually what lives in the center may not connect. Does that make sense? Anybody else? I see nodding heads like you're identifying with that. Here's the truth. Maybe, I, and I was thinking about this this past week, and it made me really uncomfortable, and I thought it would only be fair to share that discomfort with you. I asked the question, and I felt like the Lord was kind of leaning, and he said, John, if you're having trouble deciding what your telos is, maybe you should just take a look at where you spend your time. So why don't you think about that? Uh, how we spend our time is one of the ways that it can reveal your telos or what's at your center. So just take 10 seconds here. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I want you to think about just this past week, what was the thing you spent the most time on? <laughs> Cleaning out a trailer? <laughs> Pete's on the way in. He told me, all right, clean out a trailer. It's got some work done. You got it in your mind? Okay, we're going to do that one, two, three thing again. I want you to yell it out. What's your telos according to how much time you spent on it? Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A <laughs> trailer. <laughs> it ought to reveal something. And another kind of way to do this is what do you spend your money on? Woo! Come on now, John. I'm getting a little uncomfortable now. What's your telos? And here's the thing. When, it re- when, when your center is revealed, when your telos is revealed, and it's something other than God, we're going to talk about that this morning in more in depth, but if it's like my family or my money or my career or, you know, or my trailer, you know, if it's, if it's something other than God, what tends to happen is we have the threat of it leaving us. Here's another question, a little deeper, that I was kind of dealing with. What happens when your defined or your discerned telos goes away? Maybe your telos is your career. I identify, man, I'm like, I'm a pastor. I've given my life to trying to be the best pastor that I can be. But what happens if something happens in my life and I'm not a pastor anymore? Pastor Steve and I have just, we've been talking about this recently. What happens when something that you give yourself to goes away? What about your finances? Maybe your finances are, te- are your telos. You're, you're proud of your finances. You have prepared. You have saved. You have invested. It is your security. You have given so much time to make sure you have so that you can give. Well, all those are good things. But what happens if your money goes away? What happens to your telos? Maybe it's your relationships, marriage, husband, wife, kids, I don't know about you, but I just walked a journey with a family just this past week. In a moment, in a blink of an eye, your life situation can change. And if your telos is something that it shouldn't be, oftentimes the result can be chaos. It's happening through this little story. I'm going to read it to you because uh, I can read it better than I can tell it to you from memory. But it's, it's a story about what happens when we get the wrong 
thing at our center, when our orientation is just a little off. It says this, in 1914, not long after the sinking of the Titanic, Congress convened a hearing to discern what happened in another nautical tragedy. In January of that year, in thick fog off the Virginia coast, the steamship Monroe was rammed by the merchant vessel Nantucket and eventually sank. 41 sailors lost their lives in the frigid waters of the Atlantic. And while it was Osman Berry, captain of the Nantucket, who was arraigned on charges, in the course of the trial, Captain Edward Johnson was grilled on the stand for over five hours. And during cross-examination, it was learned, as the New York Times reported, that Captain Johnson navigated the Monroe with a steering compass that deviated as much as two degrees from the standard magnetic compass. He said the instrument was sufficiently true to run the ship and that it was the custom of masters in the coastwide trade to use such a compass. His steering compass had never been adjusted in the one year that he was master of the Monroe. And the faulty compass that seemed adequate for navigation eventually proved otherwise. This realization partly explains a heart-rending picture recorded by the Times. Later, the two captains met, clasped hands, and sobbed on each other's soldiers or shoulders. The sobs of these two burly seamen are a moving reminder of the tragic consequences of misorientation. What happens in your life when your telos, your center, goes away or shifts or moves or moves you in a direction of life that is not the way God intended for your life to go? The result is chaos, friends. When we have a misalignment in life, we have chaos, we have this reality, and all of a sudden it begins to change something in us. Because when we perceive our telos moving or shifting, something, a human response happens inside of us where all of a sudden we we have this little thing called scarcity that kind of attaches to us, and we have a fear that we're going to lose something that is desperately a part of who we are as people. And I don't know about you, but when I fear that I'm about to lose something that is desperately a part of my identity, or my security, boy, do I fight to keep it. Anybody else? And when fear and scarcity rules my life, chaos ensues. Because a misaligned life is a life ruled by scarcity and the fear of losing what's in the center. And it's this reality that has stirred my heart to want to ask the Lord, God, how do we take the diss out of discontentment? If, you, if you're a human here today, which I, I'm assuming all of you are, you struggle with this reality of having the wrong thing in the center. And God wants to open our eyes and tell us, show us the way, how do we remove the diss from discontent? How do we find contentment? I've been a student in the Bible for a long, long time. And most of the Bible, I'll be honest, is really confusing. <laughs> Anybody else have that experience? You open it up and go, what in the world is going on? But there are, there are some beautiful moments when you open the scripture where God gives you the exact answer for the thing that you need. This contentment conversation is one of those situations. If you open up the scripture, We're going to do it here this morning. We're going to read this little scripture from the Apostle Paul. And he tells us, no joke, the secret to contentment. I love that. Here it is. The Apostle Paul tells us. He says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to us today. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. He's been in all those situations. I have learned, check it out, say it with me, one, two, three, the... One more time, I have learned the of being content. Don't you love when God makes it clear? Here it comes. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, Paul makes an assumption there with this cap, or it's not capitalized even, with this hymn. Who do you think he's talking about? Anybody? Bible scholars in the room. Jesus. He says, I can do all things. This is the secret of contentment. He says, I can do all things through Christ. See, Paul is giving us a little picture of something that happened in his life. So, see, see, Paul had a lot of different things in his center. A lot of different things that were, that were becoming the telos of his life, but he had a, a transcendent encounter, a mysterious encounter with the risen Christ that completely changed the trajectory of his life. And this is what he speaks out of that experience. He says, I have found the secret to being content in all things. Now we may say, well, that's, that's nice and easy for a religious guy like Paul to say, right? 
because he's probably had it pretty good. Well, I want you to check out a little passage. It's actually the wrong passage on the screen. It's 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27, not first. You can pop it up there. At 2 Corinthians, here's a little picture, 2 Corinthians 11, if you're reading it with me. Here's a little picture of Paul's life. Uh, let me see, 12, 20, chapter 20, or verse 23. He says, are they servants of Christ? I am more, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed. Here, he, he kind of lists some of the experiences that the Apostle Paul has had. He said, five times I have received from the, Drew, the juice the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. Anybody been shipwrecked in the room? No, I hope not. I, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country. A lot of danger going on. In danger at the sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. And on and on and on the apostles. So Paul goes. And we think, man, it's easy for him to say, I found the secret to contentment. He must have it pretty easy. But the apostle Paul lived a pretty hard life. And just like him and us, if, if we are out of alignment, if Paul had experiences, experienced those realities while also being out of alignment in his life and relationship with God, he would have had chaos. But since he, he found something, a, found a secret, he learned that no matter what went on in life, even in the extreme circumstances of life, he could live in contentment. We're going to go back one slide to our point this morning. Because I know I missed it. I'm sorry about that. Can you go back? Can we put it up on the back screen? There it is. The secret to living a life of contentment is reorienting life around love for God. All other loves then find their proper place and balance from that center. And that, you know, I read that and I think, yeah, that's what you say in church, right? <laughs> we want, if you want to have a life of contentment, then you ought to want to have God at the center of your life. Yeah? But discontentment is evidence, friends, of things being off-center in your life. If you're here this morning and you're experiencing discontentment, I want to tell you that that is evidence, that's a symptom that something is out of whack in your relationship with God. If you have chaos, if you have turmoil, if you're living in fear that maybe tomorrow this thing that you have will go away, or this relationship that's giving you security might leave you, or I mean, fill in the blank. If you feel the presence of fear in your life because you're worried about losing the thing that gives you security, then friends, you are off center. And discontentment is right over your horizon if you're not feeling it now. It is coming your way. There are symptoms of the reality that the wrong thing is at the center of our life because discontentment equals disconnection. Can I tell you that? Discontentment in your life, if you're experiencing it today, it means disconnection. But here's the secret that the Apostle Paul was trying to stir in our hearts. He says, but if you long to have contentment, it means that you have to have connection. With God. John, who wrote the Revelation, kind of speaks of this of a body of believers who are experiencing discontentment in our life. And he, and he zeroes in, he narrows in. I love how the, the Word of God kind of cracks us open and says, This is really what it's about, church. He said, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. In the church of Ephesus, if you go back and read this little story, they were in all kinds of problems, they were living in chaos. And God said, through John, the reason that you're living in chaos is because you've lost your first love. The wrong thing is at the center. You're disconnected, which means you're discontented. And today, if we want to live in the place of contentment, if we want to find the secret that the Apostle Paul found, I believe we have to reconnect with this simple truth of scripture that I believe so many of us today in the church are missing out on, of how do we move God to the center of our life? How do we make love for God our center? And, and I've been like in the church a long time. <laughs> Like, I came out of the womb a Jesus follower, right? So I've been around church, I've been around faith, and so I know what it feels like to be in a place where you're just going through the motions. 
I know a lot about God. You know, I'm like professional God knower. You know? <laughs> I went to school to learn about God. And the thing I discovered about learning a lot about God is that knowing a lot about God does not mean that you know God. That's where you say amen, church. Because <laughs> it's true. You might, you might be sitting here today, and I know a lot of folks here at the point. Man, you, you have generations have worshiped here at the point. And you, could, you could have called yourself a Christ follower for 40, 50 years, knowing all the things about God, and yet never met him once. Maybe you're here today searching, wandering for something authentic and real. Let me tell you, let me encourage you, you are on the right track because there is only one thing that leads us to a life of contentment and that is an authentic, transcendent, mysterious encounter with the risen Christ today. There is no artificial thing about it. When Jesus shows up in your life, it changes everything. It's what the heart of Paul bursts with this. He says, I got the secret, folks. Let me tell you. I was on the road to Damascus. I was a, I was a betrayer of the gospel. I was, I was killing people in the name of God. And Jesus, the risen king, showed up in a flash of light. And he changed the course of Paul's life forever. It was a transcendent moment, not knowledge not understanding. It was the connection of those two things that required that catalyst moment where God changed everything. This morning, we're going to receive communion together as you came. And if you're watching online, I encourage you to go now and get the crackers and juice that represent what we're going to receive this morning. But, but I want to maybe try to shock your system a little bit to get out of the ordinary routine. Would that be okay? We, we did this morning as a worship team, and man, God... Just reminds me over and over again that too often we just get going through the motions and we forget that what's going on here today, what you just heard, the living word, and that word's on a page. Jesus is here, present with you. And he is the key to contentment in your life, to getting yourself back on center. But it's, it's, you don't want to put knowledge there in the middle. You want to put an encounter with the risen Christ. And God has given us so many ways to experience this reality. One of them is the sacrament of communion. You say, what is that word sacrament? I was reading this just this morning. The word sacrament is made up of two Greek words. The first is sacrer, that means sacred. You kind of guessed that, right? The second part of the word is mysterium. It means mystery. And we call it a sacrament within our tradition of faith because we believe that we're not just eating bread and drinking juice. But we believe that there is a sacred mystery that happens in these rhythms of our faith that connect us to the reality that we desperately need, that God is here today. And the same power that rose him from the grave is present with us and can change the course of your life today. I believe that with every part of me. In a minute, as the band is going to worship, we're going to just receive communion, but do it a little differently. You're going to do it on your own just as a part of worship. And what I want to challenge you with is as we worship, to just, before, before you open the bread and juice, to say, Lord, I want to know that you're here. I want to move my life from discontentment to contentment. And I know it means that I have to have a real and authentic encounter with you today. So I want to encourage you, before you take communion today, that you would just ask the Lord, God, show up as I receive and show up as I worship. As I was praying for this week coming up and... Uh, I, again, have been in the church a long time, and I had this memory that burst up in my heart. Um, it was one of those old traditional mo uh, like moves of God in your life when you're a kid that just like press in on you. And I, I had closed my eyes as I was praying, and I just heard my church singing the words to the song, Joel. Tell me the song, because it's out of my, you are my all in all, thank you. I, and the sermon's in there, and everything else is gone. You are my all in all says, Jesus, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. And I, I, I closed my eyes and I could hear my church as a young kid singing that song and the voices of the church. And there was something, again, mysterious that happens when the church hears its voice together and you encounter the reality that God is present. So I went and told Pastor Joel, I said, we're canceling the song at the end and we're going to do this song. I'm like, I get to do that because I'm the senior pastor. Right? <laughs> So we're just going to take a moment, and I'm going to pray. And then we're just going to, if you know it, great. If you don't, it's on the screen. If you want to just listen, great. But we're just going to enter in now to worship with our 
the rhythm of communion. Um, we're going to sing the song, and, and we also have just another challenge. Each, each week for the next few weeks, we're going to kind of give you things to try that will allow you, we call them spiritual rhythms, things that you can do during the week to kind of say, God, I want to experience the reality of presence. The first one here this week is fasting, the first spiritual rhythm, and maybe fasting kind of scares you. I want to kind of give you a little glimpse into maybe something to make it a little simpler. This week, I want you to try something to fill in this blank. In place of blank... Just put more God. I don't want you to see fasting from the perspective of I'm trying to lose weight or, you know, whatever, I'm trying to give up this thing. I want you just to take something in your life, God, and say, God, in place of this, in place of time on my phone, in place of, you know, my run in the morning, you can set you free, you don't have to exercise, right? In in place of this thing, just put more God, whatever that looks like for you. Because we want to enter into these spiritual rhythms of communion, of worship, of spiritual rhythms like fasting, because I believe, we believe, that they put us in contact with the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and then we're going to worship. Heavenly Father God, I pray right now you just help us to have ears to hear, heart to know, and eyes to see, that what we've heard today, what we've learned, what the Apostle Paul told us about the secret to contentment is putting you at the center. In these next few weeks, God, as we journey together, learning more about this contentment journey, we believe it starts today with putting aside obligation and going through the motions and saying, Lord, right here, right now, we want to meet with you. We're just going to sing, church. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my only, you know. And seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my only, you know. Let's sing it together, church. And Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is And Jesus, Lamb of God, and worthy Time. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my Seeking you as the precious truth. Lord, to give up, I be a fool. We lift your name, Jesus, the same. And Jesus, Lamb of God, and worthy is your name. pray as we continue to worship now. Heavenly Father, that you would connect our head and hearts together in the simple truth, the secret to contentment in life. No matter what we're going through, no matter who we've lost, God, no matter what we've lost, no matter what we've been through, no matter what we've experienced, no matter the, the sinful consequences of our own choices, God, today we believe that you can move us from discontent to contentment by putting you in the center of our lives. I pray for those who are here today that have been going through the motions for a long time. As we worship now, may they have an encounter with you, my risen king. Might you change and transform them and put them on a journey where they can have less of this and more of you. 
to put you at the center. And for the one that's searching God this morning that doesn't know you, I pray in Jesus' name that they would have an encounter with you, that sacred mystery where you would come in and show them, God, that you are real, you are true, and that you can change everything about life. As we sing, as we worship now as a church, as we receive communion on our own, God, we trust this time to you that you would do the work that only you can do in our lives as you become our center. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All the things that I have held dear, the vanities that whispered in my ear, what would I do if they all disappeared? Riches and fame and all that they could buy I've come to find they never satisfy What would I gain if my soul's the prize? And I don't want to love what the world loves I don't want to chase what this world does I only want you I only want you So first things first I seek your will Not my own Surrender all my wants to you And keep the first things first To live your truth Walk your ways Send my eyes Lord I fix my face on you To keep the first thing first I give it all, my life an offering My heart is yours, so have your way in me Your kingdom's all I want to see And I don't want to love what the world does I don't want to chase what the world does Did 
make this world seem more than enough its promise is fleeting of water and wine i emptied the cup and found myself wanting but there is a well that never runs dry come on church the water of life the blood of the vine because all i know is everything i have means nothing jesus is you not my I ask and this I will see if only to know you to be where you are and go where you lead my God I will follow the things of this world I count as lost yeah, yeah. I lay it all down and take up this cross Oh, 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 oh. oh, let me hear 
Hallelujah, church. Oh, I want nothing. I want nothing but to know you and to be with you, my God. And I'll see. Oh, 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 oh. praise in this place you are my strength when I am weak you are the treasure that I see you are my Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my only hope. And Jesus, Lamb of God, oh, worthy is your name. And Jesus, oh, Lamb Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. Oh, when I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, when I am dry oh God, you fill. You are my all in all. He is Jesus. Jesus. Just worship him, church. I'm so challenged today by that word, Pastor John. When he asked that question, where do you spend most of your time? It's like, ooh, kind of gets in my grill a little bit, right? And I reflected back and it's like, man, is, is where I spend my time where I should? And does that mean that Christ is at the center of who I am and all that I am and all that I do. And so thank you for that challenging word for all of us today. 
Man, I'm looking forward to this series and as Pastor John un unpacks this, this whole idea of discontentment in our lives, I'm looking forward to these next weeks together as uh, we just learn that Christ is at the center. What a great way to start. He's at the center of it all. And he is where we find hope and he is where we find contentment and peace and identity and all of those things. And so may we live in that place this week. May we live in that space this week as we go about our lives and our doing that he that he is our telos, that he is at the center of all that we are and who we are. Amen. May you go from this place rejoicing in all that Christ has done. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Go in his grace and in his peace, church. You are my 